One would be hard put to find a set of whole numbers with a more fascinating history and more elegant properties surrounded by greater depths of mystery and more totally useless than the perfect numbers. That's what famed mathematics writer Martin Gardner had to say about the so-called perfect numbers. And perfect is certainly a description of a number that should grab your attention. Today, we'll introduce perfect numbers, see some examples, some non-examples, touch on a little bit of history, and introduce a really cool theorem called the Euclid Euler theorem. The most most pressing question is what are perfect numbers? Here I've put what are basically three equivalent definitions of perfect numbers. They all come down to the divisors of a number. The divisors of 10, for example, are 1, 2, 5, and 10. Although we would say that 10 is not a proper divisor of 10. Proper divisors are divisors that are less than the number in question. So what are the definitions of a perfect number? Well, here's what I think is the most common one. A perfect number is a positive integer that is equal to half the sum of its divisors. So it's a number that if we took its divisors and added them all up, we would get twice the number. That's what makes a perfect number. Let me show you an example. Consider the number 6. What are the divisors of 6? Well, that would be 1. 1 is a divisor of every positive integer. We also have 2 and 3 and 6 itself. Those are all divisors of 6. Now, if we add them up, what do we get? 1 plus 2 is 3 plus 3 is 6, and then plus 6 is 12, and that's twice 6. So you can see that 6 is indeed half the sum of its divisors. All of its divisors add up to 12, 6 is half of that, and so 6 is a perfect number. 6 is perfect. So take that, all you 6 haters out there. You might look at this and think, why bother including 6 with the divisors? Because if we had excluded 6, then we would have had just 1 plus 2 plus 3, which gives us 6 exactly, instead of giving us 12, which is 2 times 6. And indeed, we could define perfect numbers like that too, where we exclude the number itself. Here's that definition. A perfect number is a positive integer equal to the sum of its proper divisors. If we only include proper divisors, then for a perfect number, the sum of those proper divisors will precisely equal the number. Just like we saw with six, when we added the proper divisors, excluding six itself, the sum was exactly six. So this is an equivalent definition. And here's another way that we could put this definition. The aliquot sum of a number is the sum of its proper divisors. So there is a word for this thing. It's called an aliquot sum. And we could represent it, or write it rather, as S of n. So s of 6 is 6, and that's what makes 6 a perfect number. Again, the aliquot sum is the sum of the proper divisors of a number. So all numbers d that divide n, where d is not equal to n, those are the proper divisors of n. And a number is perfect if it equals its aliquot sum. 6 equals the aliquot sum of 6, it equals the sum of its proper divisors, that's what makes it perfect. So a perfect number is a positive integer that equals its aliquot sum, the sum of its proper divisors. You may be surprised to know that perfect numbers were recognized as far back as ancient times. Pythagoreans around 500 BC, they studied perfect numbers to some degree. So this interesting property some numbers have has been catching our attention for quite a while. Let's take a look at some non-examples of perfect numbers and some more actual examples as well. Start with one. Is one a perfect number? Well, the only divisor of 1 is 1 itself, and 1 is not a proper divisor of 1 because 1 is not less 
than 1. So 1 actually has no proper divisors, so certainly the sum of its proper divisors is not 1. So 1 is not perfect. Maybe a more interesting example, what about 4? There's a little bit more going on with 4. What are the proper divisors of 4? That would be 1 and 2. And that's it. And if we add those together, we get 3, which is less than 4, not equal to 4. So 4 is not perfect. Let's quickly go through the example of a perfect number we already saw. 6. 6 is a perfect number because it's equal to half the sum of its divisors. Or alternatively, it's exactly equal to the sum of its proper divisors. What's the next perfect number? I don't want to spoil it too quickly, so take a second and try to figure it out if you're interested. Here it is. The next perfect number after 6 is 28. Let's see, why is 28 perfect? Well, because it's equal to half the sum of its divisors. So let's go through its divisors. 1, 2, 4, 7, 14, and then 28. So if we add these things together, all of these divisors, we should get 56. Let's see. 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 4 is 7, plus 7 is 14, plus 14 is 28, plus 28 is 56. It works. Look at that. 28 is perfect. For your curiosity, here are the next few perfect numbers. So in total, those are the first seven. You may wonder, how many perfect numbers are there? Well, we actually don't know. You may suspect that there are infinitely many, but we don't know if there are or not. So far, we only know of 51 perfect numbers at the time of recording, and the biggest one has nearly 50 million digits, so they get pretty darn big. Now, for the next two perfect numbers, 496 and 8,128, I wrote the sum of their factors so you can see how that works, the sum of their divisors. I opted to not do that with the next few because the list is just getting a little too big. I don't want to put all that on the screen. Mathematicians have been conjecturing things and proving things about perfect numbers for quite some time, but since they get so big and are so rare, they are difficult to find, especially without computers. In the Middle Ages, 6, 28, 496, and 8,128 were the only known perfect numbers. And with this very small amount of evidence, a couple conjectures were made. There is a perfect number between each power of 10. There's a conjecture. Seems plausible, right? We've got 6 between 1 and 10. We've got 28 between 10 and 100. We've got 496 between 100 and 1,000. And then 8,128 between 1,000 and 10,000. Another conjecture. Perfect numbers and alternately in 6 and 8. As you can see, the first four follow that rule. 6... 8, 6, 8. So maybe the next one ends in 6 as well. What do you think? Were these conjectures true or not? Going back to our list of 7 perfect numbers, we see that neither conjecture was true. The last digits of perfect numbers start off going 6, 8, 6, 8, and then the next one does end in 6, but the one after that ends in 6 as well, so they don't end alternatively in 6 and 8. And as far as having a perfect number between every power of 10 goes, that wasn't the case either. You can see after 8,128, there wasn't a, another perfect number until over 33 million. So there was no five-digit perfect number and no six-digit perfect number, and no seven-digit perfect number. So that was not true either. While the first four perfect numbers were known during ancient times, it wasn't until the mid-15th century that somebody discovered the next perfect number. So pretty tough to find these guys. Coming back down to these pair of conjectures that both ended up being false, there is another conjecture you might wonder about, which is, are all the perfect numbers even? Because all the ones we've seen so far are. Not just the ones I've shown you. In fact, 
every perfect number known to man currently is even. So is every perfect number even? We actually don't know, which is pretty darn surprising. We don't know if there are odd perfect numbers. Are they all even or not? We don't know. We do know that all even perfect numbers will end in 6 or 8, but as we saw, they don't alternate between 6 and 8. But all even perfect numbers do end in 6 or 8. As far as the odd perfect numbers go, we don't know if they even exist. On this matter, my favorite mathematician Leonard Euler said, whether there are any odd perfect numbers is a most difficult question, which I suppose is proven to be very accurate. It is a hard question. Now, the last thing I want to show you will lead into some future lessons where we'll prove our first results regarding perfect numbers. I want to show you a certain way we can write these perfect numbers. Let's start with 6. Notice that 6 is equal to 2 times 3. And another way we could write 3 closely related to a power of 2 is like this. 2 times 2. 2 squared minus 1, because 2 squared minus 1 is 4 minus 1, which is 3. And maybe just for kicks, I'll put the power of 2 over there as well. So 2 to the power of 1 times 2 to the 2 minus 1. What about the next perfect number, 28? Could we write it in a way that's similar to this? Indeed we could. 28 is equal to 4 times 7. 4, of course, is 2 squared, and 7, you may notice, is 2 to the power of 3 minus 1. In fact, every even perfect number, which may or may not be every perfect number, we don't know that yet, but every even perfect number can be written just like this. Every perfect number can be written as 1 less than a power of 2, times the preceding power of 2. Notice that in each case, we've got 1 less than a power of 2, but we've also got the preceding power of 2 as a factor outside the parentheses. Like here, we have 2 to the 13 minus 1. That's 1 less than a power of 2. And then we've got 2 to the power of 12. That's the preceding power of 2. It's 13 minus 1 outside of the parentheses. Every even perfect number can be written like this. And this leads into what's called the Euclid-Euler theorem. One direction of this theorem was proven by Euclid in his famous textbook, The Elements, and the other direction wasn't proven until Leonard Euler's time. Here's the theorem. An even number is perfect if and only if it can be expressed as 2 to the power of p minus 1 multiplied by 2 to the p subtract 1, where 2 to the p minus 1 is prime. You may wonder, why do we have p in the exponent instead of a more common positive integer variable like n? And the answer is that notice 2 to the p minus 1 has to be prime, which will actually only happen when p is prime. So we put that exponent as p because it has to be prime. I hope you'll agree this is a pretty cool theorem. Perfect numbers are a kind of weird thing, so it's a bit surprising that we can characterize them in such a relatively simple way. Explaining this theorem again, it is an if and only if theorem, so it goes two ways, right? For starters, if you've got an even number and it's perfect, like 6 or 28, then for sure, you can write it like this, 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1. On the other hand, if you have an even number that can be written like this, then it's perfect. The sum of its proper divisors will equal the number itself, and that's pretty darn awesome. Like I said, Euclid and Euler respectively each proved one half of this theorem, and we're going to go through a proof of it ourselves. But before we do that, we're going to want to see what Mersenne primes are. And in fact, we've already flirted with them a little bit. Mersenne primes are prime numbers like this guy here. 2 to the p minus 1. 
Remember, in this theorem, 2 to the p minus 1 has to be prime. Such a prime number is called a Mersenne prime, and we'll talk more about those next time. I'm